from our police director. And I'm really excited about the opportunity to uh, hear what he has to say. He and I moved, I think, here about the same time. So uh, have similar paths in, in, um, in our uh, integration into Manhattan. And he will be introduced in just a moment. Um, so I believe, let's see, first on the agenda, I want to recognize dignitaries who at least have uh, registered to attend. Uh, Mayor Usha Reddy, Manhattan Mayor Usha Reddy is, and I think she's on, I believe I saw her name, so um, glad that she's able to attend today. And then also Commissioner, uh, Manhattan City Commissioner Linda Morse. Um, I do want to take, the mom take a moment, if there's any other elected officials on, um, go ahead and unmute and introduce yourself. Uh, we don't, that was all we had registered, so. Okay. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to introduce our chair for this year, Larry Shope, who's on today. And, and uh, Larry has done a great job in spite of some of the challenges that have been thrown at us. And we appreciate her leadership and all the time that she's given uh, to our team and, and to our efforts. Um, I do want to remind everybody to please stay on mute. Uh, if you have a question, type it in the chat. At the conclusion of Director Butler's presentation, we will have an open uh, Q, uh, Q and A. Um, so, and I'll monitor the chat and, um, and we'll ask those questions. Um, so, let's see. Our featured sponsor for today, I'm gonna introduce is Olson and Associates and uh, Mark Baychamp will be on to say a few words and then introduce Mark, or excuse me, introduce Director Butler. Uh, I do wanna mention too, Mark is our chair elect and will be uh, chair of the board next year. So, uh, Mark, I will turn it over to you at this point. Thanks, Jason. I uh, appreciate the opportunity here to sponsor, and, and it's really back-to-back. -back. Uh, you had me for Good Morning Manhattan, and now for this. So we'll, we'll kind of change it up a little bit here. But good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, we are Olson, a nationally recognized employee-owned engineering and design firm with rich, rich history of success. Founded in 1956 on the very mindset that drives us today, we're here to improve communities by making them more sustainable, better connected, and more efficient. Simply put, we work to leave the world a better place than what we found it. Our most important asset is our people, and we are dedicated to an environment where we continue to learn and grow and thrive. This entrepreneurial spirit has made us successful and will keep us successful. And the result, inspired people, amazing designs and projects with a purpose is really a win-win for all. And uh, it's been a, a pleasure to uh, sponsor these uh, uh, Power Lunch and, and looking forward to, to next year where we can do this all again. So maybe in person. So I wanna introduce uh, the speaker, uh, 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 Dennis Butler, he began serving the citizens of Raleigh County in December of 2018. He is the fifth director since RCPD was established in 1974. Director Butler formerly served as a chief of police for Ottawa uh, Police Department. In July of 2017, he was appointed to serve a one-year term on the CALEA Executive Director's Advisory Board. During 2018 and 19, he served on the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Governing Board of Directors. Prior to his position as Chief of Police for the Ottawa Police Department, Director Butler served for 25 years with the Alexandria Police Department in Alexandria, Virginia, retiring in 2004 at the rank of Captain. Director Butler has a Bachelor of Science degree in Administration of Justice uh, from George Mason University. And in 2004, a graduate certificate of administration of justice from the uh, MPA program at George Mason. He is a graduate of the University of Richmond Jepson School Leadership Certificate Program for Professional Executive Leadership. In May 2011, the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society selected Director Bar Butler as the George Mason University's Alum of the Year. He is a graduate of the FBI's National Academy, 223rd Session Professional Executive Leadership School, which trains law enforcement executives from around the globe. Dennis Butler is married and has two adult daughters. Uh, one is working in marketing and the other is in pursuing her PhD in etymolo etymology. 
So please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Raleigh County Police uh, Department Director, Dennis Butler. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for such a nice uh, introduction. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen so we can uh, see today's presentation. We can see it. All right. There we go. So when we initially uh, planned my presentation at a power lunch, it was last year, and the presentation was designed for us to talk about our core values, share that with members of the chamber and the community, and also introduced, introduced last year's RCPD core value recipients. I thought it was important, Jason and I had met a couple of times uh, after his arrival to talk about a way to uh, introduce more of our employees to the business community and to the community at large. We talked about some sort of award ceremony or luncheon where awards they've already received would be presented at, at the luncheon. Uh, obviously, I don't have those folks here today because the luncheon that was originally scheduled was postponed, postponed again and then now we're doing it virtually. So I'm gonna talk about the core values that you were gonna hear about then. But in addition, I've uh, changed up what I had planned to talk about because I just was gonna give an overview of the department in general. And I felt uh, with today's times, the narrative that we see on the evening news, and even locally to a degree, it would be important to share with uh, the chamber uh, issues of accountability that uh, involve use of force data and inter internal affairs data. And you'll see some of that data on some slides as we go through. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out about both of these additional items related to accountability is that uh, these are not new items in terms of sharing them on our website and presenting them at law board meetings. Both of these things have been done publicly for years, so I want to assure you and let people know this is not a reaction to uh, recent events. This is how we've always operated, but I think it's important to point it out, and if you or anybody you know wants to uh, go look at this data, they can find it. So back in 2008, the command staff, long before my arrival here, uh, was doing a regular review of the goals and objectives of the police department. And as part of that review, they were looking at the uh, mission statement, um, and they weren't satisfied with how the mission statement was being integrated into the daily activities of the police department. And they truly wanted to make not only the mission statement, but the values of the department, something that weren't just in a framed, um, poster on the wall or occasionally got mentioned, but that they really were a part of the everyday fabric. How did how would they weave this into the fabric of our performance, whether it's in the jail, out on the street, or in our civilian um, workforce? So as they did that, um, and you're going to see what the old one was and the new one was in a minute, they, they did decide to take the core values that they developed and make that part of every employee's annual performance evaluation. So in addition to those categories of performance that you typically would see in a performance evaluation, there's also a separate section that has each core value listed, and then there is narrative that's added to how does that employee adhere to those core values. And uh, what I mentioned at the outset of my presentation was uh, the employees each year nominate their coworkers for these core values. Who demonstrates these the best? Uh, and it is a, a nomination process by the employees. It goes to a committee. They narrow down the list and then send it to the command staff for the final evaluate or the final selection. So I won't, um, I'm not really good, I should have said this about following my PowerPoint uh, to the letter. I don't read PowerPoints <laughs> to you because it's right there in front of you. You can read it for yourself. But you can see on the top half of this slide the former mission statement. 
as you read it slowly and dissect all of this, it all makes perfect sense, I would hope. But how does this really integrate into everyday performance and service to you? And is it something that employees are going to remember? Is it something that they can think about in terms of what are we really here to do? So it was shortened to this, to reduce crime and improve the quality of life for the citizens we serve. It seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Of course, it encompasses quite a few things. In fact, on the opening slide, I don't know if you noticed it, but this mission statement was listed at the bottom of the opening slide. And when I uh, make formal presentations of any kind, I try to remember to recite this, even when they're internal meetings with large groups of employees, we always remind ourselves of what we're here to do. So you heard me, I told you I don't follow my PowerPoints very closely. So here uh, in the second half of this slide, you'll see some narrative about how do we take the core values that were identified and established and integrate them into everyday performance and measure it on an annual performance evaluation. And so this is what the command staff came up with uh, back in 2008. And, uh, this was a, a collaborative process. There were also employees involved in this work. It wasn't just the command staff coming up with these eight things and then pushing it down to the rank and file. Uh, all of these things, as you look at them uh, in your own businesses, uh, you probably look at these and think, yes, these, these are great eight core values. We, we practice these here, um, and they make sense. Uh, but I want to take one for example. I'm not going to read the definition of each one, but I'm going to take one because sometimes when people see this in police work, they uh, sometimes it carries a negative connotation. And I just want to give you an example of why it shouldn't. And it's the second one that uh, reads loyalty. And in our evaluation, the definition, and this is what's used when nominees are, uh, or people are nominated for the annual Core Values Award, uh, the definition for loyalty here at the RSTPD is demonstrating the character quality of being loyal and the willingness to be faithful to commitments or obligations. So this isn't blind loyalty to the police department. This isn't blind loyalty to cover for each other if something goes poorly. This talks about being faithful to your commitments, both internally to your oath and to the service that you provide. So this is not just a poster on the wall. All of these things have definitions that are taken seriously and practiced to the best of our ability. Now I'm gonna transition into a use of force study. This study did not involve the RCPD. This study and the uh, footnote shows the source of this study was conducted just a couple of years ago in 2018. And the, uh, the researchers uh, pulled data from three mid-sized police departments. A mid-sized police department in our industry usually is anywhere from about uh, 250 to 1,000 police officers. And so the names of those departments are not listed here, uh, but as part of the research, they reviewed uh, about a million or a little over a million calls for service in those three mid-sized police departments. I would guess from that number of calls, this uh, research probably covered a couple of years, maybe two, three, four years to come up with that number of calls. And what the researchers found was that in uh, 1,167 calls, or for every 1,167 calls for service, uh, only one resulted in any type of force being used. And you can see in parentheses uh, what that percentage is. And uh, of all of those, they looked at uh, the use of force and found that in arrest situations, so you have calls involving arrest situations, that force of any type was used 
in one out of every 128 calls, and you can see what that percentage is. Key finding that I'd like to emphasize here is in the second bullet there, and that is that in those million cases uh, or more, uh, only one fatality was uncovered in calls for service out of a million uh, opportunities for something to go horribly wrong and result in a death. And in those use of force instances, 98% of the suspects sustained uh, only uh, no injury, and when they did sustain an injury, it was mild in nature. And we're going to go on to another slide here in a second and talk about RCPD use of force. And I'll probably toggle back to this slide because I want to show something to you um, to just, just to make a point. One thing I wanted to let you know is this is raw data uh, there. I did read a little bit of the study, but there's a lot of things that I don't know about how these departments operate because I don't know who they are. So if we go to RCPD, I just had a graph uh, prepared by our intelligence unit showing the last three years of use of force data in the RCPD. Um, and there's two bars you see there for each year, 2017, 18, and 19. The blue bar shows you the number of incidents that were reported by officers in uses of force for each year. Now, what's confusing to, if you're unfamiliar with our data is the red bar, which is titled applications. The applications is always at least twice almost in one case last year three times as much. Why is that? What that means is in an incident there could be more than one suspect and there could be more than one officer. In fact sometimes there can be two or three officers. So when an incident occurs at the same location at the same time that's one incident. Every application of force whether it's one officer, two officers, or three officers is also collected as part of that use of force incident. And sometimes the officers use force more than once. They might try one option, that's ineffective. So then they try another option, that's ineffective. And they keep using force until the situation is under control and stabilized. And almost always use of force is never used unless the officer is protecting themselves from uh, attack or it's an arrest situation, which really is most situations. Somebody is being placed under arrest and they're resisting. At the, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the number of calls that we handled in 2019. You'll see that number on several slides because I'm trying to drive home the point, again, of how many opportunities we have to use force uh, in, this, in, a, in a calendar year and how many actually occur. Now, the last bullet on this slide, it shows that out of every 500 calls, there's a use of force. Now, let me go back to the previous slide. Those researchers found one use of force every 1,100 calls. So at the RCPD, it looks like we use force at twice the rate. An untrained eye would look at that and go, wow, they're really heavy-handed at the RCPD. You look at these three unknown departments and their rates of use of force are much lower. Here's what I can tell you from my experience, not only here but in previous departments and ones that I've worked with. Many departments, not many, there's a minority of departments and we're one of them and a lot of it has to do with us being accredited. We report categories of use of force and attempts of use of force that most departments don't. Here's an example. Uh, if we train an officer how to use a control hold to gain uh, control over somebody who's uh, under arrest, and that's a trained department technique and the person's resisting, that is a use of force. Many departments, in fact, the majority of police departments do not count that as a use of force. The only time they would is if the suspect were injured during the application of that technique or um, if the, or the suspect complains that they're injured. So there's no visible injury, but they complain of pain or some other uh, injury to them in which they'd have to go to the hospital and be examined. So 
let me give you another example. Most departments, if an officer draws their pepper spray from its holster or their taser from its holster and point it at somebody and make a threat to use it to gain compliance, most departments do not count that as a use of force. We do. So the threat of using uh, a tactic is counted as a use of force and actually using it is a use of force. So just a quick list of some of those things are any type of trained defensive tactic, a baton of any kind, sometimes handcuffs. Now we don't strike suspects with handcuffs, but if the handcuffs are applied and they're violently resisting, handcuffs can be manipulated to create pain in the wrist area to gain compliance. That's a use of force if it's done intentionally to gain compliance, not just to put handcuffs on somebody. Any kind of chemical spray, tasers, firearms, tire deflation devices. So if a use of force is a tire deflation device or, or stop sticks is used to stop a car, not a person, but a car carrying a person, that's a use of force. So I want you to know, while it looks like we use use of force at a much higher rate, we report a lot more internally because we want to evaluate our training, the justification that the officer had if it was within policy, and then address those things to make sure what we're teaching is effective and what we're using is within the law and also within policy. So the next slide, we also collect data on injuries uh, as a result of use of force. In the blue, and I'm just using 2019 here, otherwise this slide would have gotten too busy. I know on Zoom, sometimes it's hard to see graphics on PowerPoints. So we just used 2019. So um, in uh, the bar graph to the far left titled no injury at the bottom there, the blue are employees, RCPD employees, employees and red are subjects. So in those uses of force that you saw on the previous slide in 2019, um, there were no injuries in uh, the majority of the cases. The middle column shows injury reported. So the blue bar are employees, so 10 employees reported an injury of some kind. Uh, suspects reported 14 injuries. And then the far right column with just the red bar is titled unknown and there's six listed there and you might wonder well how could you not know in six applications of force whether or not somebody was injured or not injured uh, unfortunately we don't catch everybody <laughs> some suspects get sprayed uh, or some other use of force is applied and they run away and escape and we don't catch them so we don't know if they were injured or not, but we report that. We report that we used it, but we don't know if they were actually hurt or not. One thing that's important if you look at the bullets is no major injuries occurred either to employees or suspects in 2019. And of the 14 that reported being injured of suspects, uh, the most common injuries were scrapes, bruising, joint pain, again, nothing serious. So let's move on to internal affairs. Use of force and internal affairs are two different things. I failed to mention that if we do find that a use of force occurred outside of our policy guidelines, the supervisor can request an, uh, an administrative action or an internal investigation to find out what happened. And uh, potentially an employee could be disciplined for violating use of force guidelines. So again, at the top of this slide, you see, again, 50,000 calls for service in 2019. And there's two categories of uh, complaints. One is uh, an IA, an IA or an internal affair complaint is submitted by a citizen. An AA or an administrative action is initiated by our own employees who are aware of policy violations by a coworker. You'll see on the next slide in a second, we'll show you again a bar graph of four years illustrating these two categories. And then I'm going to talk about the ratio of, uh, of the difference between the numbers in those two categories. And again, to the untrained eye, it doesn't mean a whole lot. 
but I'm going to give you my perspective based on my years of experience of what this ratio tells me about the RCPD. So here's the graph, and you can, again, find this on our website, this data. You can find it in previous law board packet meetings. So every year when we do our annual report on internal affairs, we also include the last four years of data before that. So in 2015, and I'm not going to read each one of these, you see the blue bar. The blue bar is uh, between 30 and 35 citizen-generated or excuse me, excuse me, I got that backwards. Those are internal or RCPD generated policy violation investigations where one employee initiates an investigation based on a policy violation that they believe that has occurred. The green bar are citizen driven ones or the ones that are internal investigations the blue is administrative actions. If you go back to the last slide, you can see those top two bullets with the definition. Then in 16, you, you see that blue bar, which is internal, drop a little bit. Again, in 17, 18, it was about the same. In 19, it was about the same. And anybody looking at this would think, huh, they don't look like they're being quite as diligent at the RCPD of holding their employees accountable. But here's a, a couple of points I want to make. If you look at the green bars, those are the complaints generated by citizens. If you look at those, except for a slight uh, uptick above 10 in 2017, they're all between five and 10 complaints a year. And if you look down at that bottom bullet there, that's uh, 50,000 opportunities for citizens to file complaints against the actions of RCPD employees. And that doesn't just mean police officers. That means correctional officers, dispatchers, and uh, other non-sworn staff. But here's the ratio that really jumps out at me, and it wouldn't at you, because I've seen this data in other departments when they publish it. And this really shows that you have a healthy department and you're thinking, well, why is that? If the blue bar, which is internal complaints, was actually green and those were citizen complaints and the green bar were internal complaints, what that tells me as the director is that we are not policing ourselves well enough internally and poor performance is now affecting service to the public to the degree that they're filing complaints at a much higher rate. I've seen data from a Kansas police department that's a little bit bigger than us not too long ago. These, these numbers were inverted. Their citizen complaints were much higher than their internally generated complaints. So what this tells me is because we are, I'm going to use my mouse here for a second, because we're generating these complaints internally, we are heading off poor performance or correcting it, not heading it off, correcting it, holding employees accountable, retraining them in many cases before that service affects or that performance affects service to the public, which is here in green. This is an extremely telling graphic and most people wouldn't draw that conclusion, but I wanted to share that perspective with you. So here's the result right here, and this is in our annual report that's published on our website and also given to the law board, of the result of both internal and external, or internal um, are the AAs and the external or the IA complaints each year. Now I highlighted three categories for you, uh, but before I describe those, let me describe what these columns read. One is the allegation numbers for each category, so failure to take appropriate action, there were seven compl uh, complaints filed uh, in 2019. Then there's four categories of classification. The first one is unfounded, the second one is exonerated, the third one is unsubstantiated, and the fourth one is basically substantiated or we find improper conduct. So unfounded, what, what's the difference between these two? Unfounded means a complaint was made, and this is usually by a citizen, and we find absolutely zero evidence of any 
contact between the employee and the citizen. They were never together. They were never in the same place, basically. Uh, so you can draw your own conclusions about what that means. We didn't receive any unfounded complaints during 2019. Exonerated means, uh, yeah, there was contact. Uh, they were at the same place. The citizen made a complaint. But it turns out the officer was completely within or the employee was completely acting within policy. So they were exonerated. Unsubstantiated. This is the difficult one that, you know, I hate using this, but we have no choice sometimes. And that means something happened. The citizen said one thing, the officer said another thing. We really don't have enough evidence to determine that policy was violated. And uh, all of these results are shared with whoever makes the complaint. So they're classified as unsubstantiated. And the number there for 19 was nine. And then the last one was improper conduct. And you can see all the ones that were found to be in violation of policy, and that number was 15. So 15 out of 25 complaints, improper conduct was determined. So the three that I highlighted, I wanted to point these out. Failure to take appropriate action is the number one source of complaints. Courtesy, where an officer uh, had a bad day. I hate to make an excuse, but that's basically, or it could be a civilian or a correctional officer. They did something that wasn't meeting our core values in terms of how they interact with other people. And it could be an internal interaction. It could be one employee not being courteous to another. We take that seriously as well. I wanted to point out this one because I didn't want you to think I was going to gloss over this, discrimination. This particular one last year involved two employees uh, where one employee, who, and they were friends from what I was told, made a racial stereotypical comment about a food item in a, a shared refrigerator in a break room uh, in the presence of the other employee. The other employee was offended, filed a complaint. We investigated it and found that the employee had violated our policy and how she uh, or they made this comment when they thought they were just making it in good fun. So I wanted to show this to you so you could uh, get a better idea of some of the categories that we generally look at in terms of uh, performance and where we could find violations and uh, complaints could be generated as a result. So that concludes my uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I could have said a lot of things there that would really generate lots of questions, uh, and I'm happy to, to scroll back to any slides for reference. But I really hope that these few minutes were very helpful in you gaining some insight into uh, what we expect of our employees, how we apply it when uh, there's underperformance, and uh, that we do hold them accountable when there is, and that accountability often involves training, sometimes it involves a letter of reprimand, sometimes it involves a day off. Uh, we terminated an employee last year uh, because of a policy violation. So with that said, uh, Jason's going to read to me any questions he may have picked up on the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. All right, well, uh, Director Butler, thank you so much for that thorough presentation and, and transparent presentation. Um, we have a few questions. I'm going to kick one off with, with a topic I'm sure you're thrilled to address, but uh, just real quick, uh, I know you had some concerns initially on um, the mask ordinance, just an update maybe on, on uh, reports from your officers on how the public has responded and, and, and any and, and issues that have come up as part of that. Yeah, I've said this publicly before uh, that this for us, for me, this is uh, this is new territory in terms of policing, exercising our authority, trying to strike the right balance with our citizens and also with genuine concerns about safety. And uh, we are fortunate here so far that we haven't had citizens intentionally try to bait us into a situation and force us to enforce the ordinance. We've had situations that we've been called to or that we've seen where 
Um, there's a, looks like a violation has occurred. We talk to the people involved. Almost always, even if it's not a friendly conversation, we gain compliance. We have given out masks that were provided to us uh, from the hospital. Um, and we have had some situations working with the health department where warnings have been given to some places with the, the message that, you know, if this happens again, then there could be uh, some sanctions in terms of a case being sent to the county attorney's office or in the city ordinance, a citation being written. So it's very, I, I'll be frank with you, it's, it's, it's stressful dealing with this because the employees and I know that we're dealing with people who in their normal everyday lives are doing things they've done their entire lives that have always been legal and appropriate. And now um, these things are not in some cases. And so it's, it's going well. And I really thank our, our uh, citizens really for not making this harder than it has to be for everybody. I, I agree with that. Um, so first question, how are things going in general as students make their way back to town and maybe as part of that, maybe talk about the challenges, uh, the unique challenges that, that a police department in a college town have compared to, to maybe other places where you've been. Well, I'm fairly new to a, a Division I college town, uh, but uh, I, I was telling some folks, I might have told Jason this the other day, that uh, I've never been so excited to see a bunch of moving trucks and pickup trucks loaded with stuff clogging up our city streets. Uh, it's always nice to, uh, when there's no traffic, but I know what that means for our community to have that traffic back. So I was very excited to see that. As we go into this new school year with all of these health concerns and restrictions placed on them, uh, businesses, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just going to increase that challenge that I was just talking about. I think uh, lately, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, absolute, but lately on the news and in uh, other areas, uh, these big gatherings where there's violations and no masks being worn, a lot of times involve young people. And that could happen here. And so we've got our work cut out for us again in trying to keep everybody healthy and also uh, keep people uh, following the mask ordinance voluntarily. So I'm happy to see them back. I know what this means to our business community and to our city to have these students back in our community. And we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that they stay here for the full school year um, and also emerge from this entire situation with our credibility and reputation intact as a police department because we're gonna be here for a long time and a lot of these students and others will finish their education and leave and, and won't be back. So that's really important to me that we approach it that way. So, so aside from the COVID situation, what, what are the differences maybe in, in university communities compared to non-university communities from, from a policing standpoint? Well, what, what I've noticed, I mean, the last community that I was in had a, a four-year school, but it was much smaller. Uh, you just see a huge increase in uh, population, a uh, huge increase in traffic. Uh, I can tell you that when the lockdown occurred back in March, uh, we saw a dramatic drop in crime. Now, I always, I always qualify that remark by saying that doesn't mean that students were responsible for the crime. Students are also victims of crime. And when your population drops that dramatically, and people who live here aren't out and about. It, I, knew, I knew crime would drop, but it dropped uh, in the order of 50%, especially our serious crime. Traffic accidents dropped over 60%. Calls for service at one point were down by 27%. All of those figures have ticked back up, but they're still below historical levels. So really what we're seeing uh, in a community with a college population like this is just the return of that big population just creates more work. That's just how it is. And that's what we're here to address uh, and continue to deal with uh, effectively and fairly, hopefully. Okay. Um, so I know there's been one of, one of our questions, there's been a lot of discussion about the disproportional contact between police and minorities. 
Um, do, do you track that data and what does that look like um, for RCPD? Well, when we want to do a deep dive on an issue, we can extract that data from our records management system when we have it. Uh, people are not obligated to disclose their race or their ethnicity to us. Uh, some we ask, and if they give it, we record it. And so the, the disparity in, um, I gotta be careful how I say this, because I don't wanna say something that sounds misleading, that is misleading or sounds defensive. Um, we are heavily reliant on data in how we deploy our police officers. So where our data shows us there's lots of calls for service on particular issues, or we take reports from victims, or there's lots of traffic accidents, that's another good example. It makes sense to us to devote resources to those areas and to those issues. And we don't look at it from the standpoint of, well, there's a lot of minorities living here, so we need to be here. If the data doesn't show us to be there, then we devote our resources in other places. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's a roundabout way of saying, well, you only police minority neighborhoods. That is not what I'm saying. Um, I could use the North County as a quick example. North County residents would like more police coverage up there. And I've shown them the data on the calls for service up there and the crime up there. And not to get into a battle with them, but just to say, hey, listen, it's really hard for me to justify additional staffing up here when this is the level of service that you need. I did add a supervisor up there because there wasn't one supervising them directly, but it wouldn't make sense to do that. Now, here's another important key about uh, this question. When we identify crime trends and patterns in certain areas of the city, uh, we don't just flood the area with cops, stop everything that moves, identify everybody, shake them down. Each issue, is, we develop a strategy for that issue. And that strategy is what we give to our officers and say, when you have free time, proactive time, when you're not on a call for service, we want you to go to these areas, use these strategies, and see if it reduces crime. Because that's really what it's all about, is reducing crime in a constitutional manner. George Mason University, just coincidentally, we've been working with them since 2011 on just these kinds of data issues. And they came out with a preliminary finding recently. The paper's not out because of everything that's happened post-George Floyd. Their, their criminology department has been uh, distracted on other issues. But typically, what we're talking about is hot spots. A lot of police departments will send a ton of resources to an area that has a concentration of crime. It's called a hot spot. And what his history shows is that crime typically gets displaced. So it, it doesn't stay where it was. It just moves to another location. Crime doesn't go down usually. You just relocate it. What George Mason has found after dissecting and evaluating our data for about the last nine years is that not only is crime dropping in the hotspot areas by on the order of 7%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's dropping, overall city crime and community crime is dropping 5%. That got their attention. That raised their eyebrows. So we're we think, I think, it's not just flooding an area with officers, it's employing strategies to deal with that crime to get it to stop permanently, not just displace it. So again, I just wanna reassure people, it's not about what you look like, it's about what the data and where the crime is being reported and we deploy our officers to use those strategies to address it in a constitutional way that adheres to those eight core values you saw me list at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, um, last question from our audience, um, and you, you just referenced it, but um, your opinion on the George Floyd incident and how that's impacted um, policing in Manhattan. Um, 
you know, I've seen a lot of things over the last 40 years that have impacted policing nationally and caused uh, reforms to occur. And I think sometimes reform carries a negative connotation. Uh, reform, when it's done thoughtfully and in a planned manner, uh, is not negative. Uh, it's designed to improve things. It's designed to improve our profession if it's done that way. When it's knee-jerk, when it's done uh, in a uh, pandering way that often uh, results in other problems or not fixing what the original concern is, it's not very effective. What I have seen here, and uh, I'm going to read it again tonight at the City uh, Commission work session, is um, I have been telling our governing bodies and our community in person by reading a letter that I want to read how much I appreciate being the director in this department in this community because of the citizens we have here who aren't allowing some of the things we're seeing in other places that have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with peaceful protests. There's others taking advantage of this opportunity in a criminal way, driving an agenda, dehumanizing police officers and, and trying to make them out to be the criminals. Uh, there are some bad apples in our profession. They need to be separated from our profession. And I've done it. Uh, many police chiefs do. You normally don't hear about that. Let me, let me point back to that slide that I showed the ratio of citizen-generated complaints ver versus internal. The fact that your police department generates at least double, sometimes three times as many complaints tells me and I'm asking you to believe that when we see underperformance, we want to correct it right away before it affects you. And if we can't, then employees are separated from the police department like they are in many places. So I think a lot of the things that we've seen as mandates as part of these reforms, these are things we already do and have been doing for a long time. Not only us, but the state of Kansas in terms of we license officers, we have a separate gov a body that can decertify them where they can't work in Kansas ever again. Uh, that exists. It's been in place for a long time. Their website is public. You can go see the names of officers that have been decertified in Kansas. There's names on that list that I was behind. It doesn't say I was behind it, but it happened. Unfortunately, we had to do those things. So the mandates, the defunding, all of those things are things that you, you have to approach thoughtfully in a, in, a, in, a, in a managed way for it to be effective and be appropriate. So I'm very fortunate, our community's fortunate that we're not experiencing that kind of reaction to what's happened. Good. Last question and then we'll let you off the hook. Um, Talk a little bit about the unique nature of RCPD in terms of the, the uh, collaboration between the city and the county to form one department and, and then advantages and maybe disadvantages of that, of that system. Well, the RCPD uh, is unique in Kansas. Uh, it's the only county police department that does not have a sheriff's office and all of the law enforcement services, SANS, the KSUPD, are in one organization. That was driven by a statutory change uh, that was approved by the voters back in 1974. And uh, it, it may be in place in other parts of the country, but if it is, I think it's very rare if it exists anywhere else. So what are some of the advantages as I see them? Some of the advantages are uh, you have one police department that has the same training, the same hiring standards, the same leadership, the same level of professionalism. And we are accredited, and only 5% of the departments in the country are. That's a whole other presentation about why that's important, but it is. The accountability, the self-auditing and reporting and outside review of what we do is not a rubber stamp. It's not mailing it in, it's serious stuff. Departments lose their accreditation, I've seen it happen. So having this single entity that is also by statute funded by the county 
and the city of Manhattan, 80% for the city, 20% by the county, but the county also manages all of our facilities. So all the property and buildings are owned by the county and maintained by them. So it's really more than 20%. And it's all funded statutorily through property tax. Now, the reason why I think that's also an advantage is I've worked in police departments and seen where economic fortunes swing wildly. And when it happens and budgets are slashed and hiring doesn't occur, I've seen the after effects and the hangover of a department that doesn't have stable funding. And sometimes it takes years to correct those that damage. The fact that property tax is a very stable revenue source and that's what's used uh, when the law board approves the budget, allows that stability to be maintained. Senior and experienced officers will stay. And here's the big thing for anybody in business. The national average on ratio of cops per thousand residents is two. So every thousand residents on average, you should have about two police officers to serve them. Riley County has almost 75,000 people. That means we should, according to that two number, the ratio, we should have about 150 police officers. We have 111 authorized positions. So instead of two, it's 1.49 is the ratio. So you're getting, I think, a tremendous value by having a consolidated department that doesn't have three or four different ones with administrations to support, for the taxpayer, so economically, it's a good deal. And about 86% of our total budget goes to personnel, the rest for stuff. Disadvantages can be because uh, I don't have a single boss, and I'm not complaining about me, I, I'm fine with this. You don't really have that accountability with a single person in that relationship. You have seven people on the law board, the law board transitions people in and out on a regular basis. So it can be a little more challenging uh, for them and for me. Uh, so far, I think it's worked very well. And uh, they also kind of double as a citizen oversight board. You know, it's not, it, meetings are public, the conversations are public, everything we give them is a public document. So those are advantages. I think there's really more advantages to this than disadvantages. And I'm really shocked that more communities don't do this. I really am. And the only thing I can surmise is it's just about turf and control. Um, and it, it just, the law board has to have the right person and leadership to make sure that the things that we should be doing as a community police department are happening. And, um, and if it's not, then they need to make sure the right person is in that position to do it. But set up the way it is, I think it's a, was a brilliant move by the citizens and the people that drove this this uh, setup. All right. Well, thank you again for being with us today. And, and uh, we appreciate your ongoing support of the business community and all the things you do to help us. And, um, and appreciate, I know we wanted to do this in person and we tried really hard to push it off to do that, but thank you for being willing to even to do it on zoom, even though it's not your favorite. Um, and we'll You're welcome. working with you in the future. Uh, before we get to our announcements, if I could just get everybody's attention, stay on the line for just a moment. Uh, I want to talk about something really important. We sent out an email a, a little bit ago uh, about grants available from the state through the SPARC um, funds. And we are working to gather information as it becomes available. Um, it, is, it is a lot on the fly from, from the State Department of Commerce, uh, but here's what we know so far. There will be grants available to businesses, and according to the email we got from Director David Tolan today, uh, or the Secretary, um, nonprofits, and um, we don't know how much yet, but um, there's $65 million that's been set aside, and, and according to the criteria, you have to have a uh, loss of 25% of revenue during COVID. We don't know exactly how they're measuring that yet. Um, we are going to be on a conference call with the state tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. As we get information, we will continue to get that out. The important thing for you to know now is if, you're, if you think you're eligible and you're interested, the application portal will go live on the Department of Commerce site. That's 
kansascommerce.gov at 4 p.m. Thursday, August 13th. Um, we have been told that this is going to be first come, first serve, which means there's going to be a lot of demand statewide and a finite amount of resources. So uh, please, if, if you think you're eligible, if you think you have 25% of losses during COVID, please get this on your calendar. Or if you, or if you work with businesses and you know, uh, have them get this on their calendar, we will continue to funnel information to everybody as we get it. And uh, certainly uh, feel free to share that because we want everybody to be aware of this program and we want to make sure that uh, all the businesses in Manhattan that are eligible to receive these, this funding will get it. So um, as we get information, we'll make sure we get that out to everybody. So again, thank you to the director. Uh, I also want to thank all of you who attended and, and our sponsors. Our program sponsor today was, was Olson. I think I called them Olson Associates. That's, that's an old name. I apologize, Mark, for doing that. Um, as well as our other Power Lunch spon sponsors, Amicus Wealth Partners, Ascension Via Christi, the Trust Company, and Twin Valley Connected Office. Uh, we have new member spotlight fr Friday, August 28th. That's at 745. Uh, and our next Gooding Man is September 17th, and that is at 745 as well. And we will be uh, planning to hold our business awards luncheon, which originally was scheduled for August. Uh, we're hopeful that some of the uh, situations now for meetings changes and we'll be able to have that in October and that would be scheduled October 13th uh, along with the business showcase. So thank you all again for attending. Uh, hope you en enjoyed uh, Director Butler as much as I did and are enjoying our Power Lunch series and we'll look forward to seeing everybody later.